What's going on guys? So today I'm going to be reviewing a film that I have watched many times before. Um, first time being when it, uh, around the time anyway, that it came out in 2006. From my memory, if it serves me right, it was probably 2008, the first watch that I've had of this film. Um, but it was released in many festivals. This is an Australian film. So it was uh, released first or premiered at the Australian Film Festival. It was at the Toronto International Film Festival. I'm not exactly 100% sure if it hit Sundance, but I know it definitely hit multiple um, festival circuits back in its day. Uh, this, is, this was directed and completed by a 22-year-old kid, and uh, it's his only uh, feature film from what uh, Wikipedia tells me. Definitely his first one, and I've seen uh, many blurbs and stuff like that that it was his first and but I, I don't seem to have find anything I don't seem to have found anything else that he's made other than uh, 237 so had this DVD for a while uh, I must say that even tonight watching it to review it um, I wanted to review this film for a long time because <clears throat> there's I'm trying to compile a list of like most disturbing and most depressing films that I've seen before and I already know that this will be number one. I have I have like a top four um, for most depressing. This is number one. Uh, Detachment would be number two, starring Adrian Brody. This is number one. Um, it's bad. Um, I It took me about an hour to an hour and a half just to prepare myself to watch this. I already had it in the player, and um, I was just... <laughs> trying to distract myself and uh with other things and youtube and stuff like that and uh knowing that i was gonna watch it for sure but i just had to like mentally prepare because i knew exactly what i was getting myself into it's funny too because i always kind of wish that i could experience this film today at my age um for the first time as a fresh view and fresh experience because the first time i watched this film i was 19. Um, again, if, uh, if, if it was 2008 that I watched it, it I would have been 19. And, uh, yeah, I just, because films are so different, you know, watching them throughout your life and they always change, it would be really fun to watch this not knowing what's going to happen because watching it, knowing what's going to be the outcome, knowing what the twist is, knowing, you know, what's going to, what's going to happen with each of the characters it's never going to be the same as me watching it for the first time. And the reason why I would want to experience it fresh is just to see if I could now predict it a lot more um, than I could back then. Like back then, I didn't predict anything. The ending of the film was a complete surprise to me. And, um, and it's just the way it is. And I always wonder what it would be like to watch it for the first time at, uh, you know, where, I, where I'm at in life today. But um, I'm going to start this review spoiler-free, and then I'm going to go into spoilers afterwards, and I will post, uh, you know, a mention when I'm going to be starting to talk about spoilers. But um, this film uh, follows a bunch of high school kids, so there's six of them, and they each have their different personalities. The film opens up with something tragic happening. We get uh, this locked door, and one of the teachers or faculty members is banging on the door, trying to get the attention of whoever's behind it and is unable to. And then the janitor is called over and the door is opened and then you just see everybody's reaction to whatever is going on on the other side. Uh, and then the film starts. So this film is directed in kind of a documentary style, or I should say mockumentary. And there's interview scenes with, with each of these six kids. Um, and they are just being asked random questions and basically describing their life in a nutshell. This happens through the entire film. And um, like I said, they're all, they're all different, but they're all, I guess not stereotypes, but they're all typical. They're all dealing with things that every high school has dealt with or will deal with or is dealing with pretty much. It's not necessarily cliche, but it is extremely realistic. And uh, I don't think there's a single person that can watch this movie that has been through high school that would not have experienced at least something <laughs> along the lines of what happens to these kids in high school. Whether it's somebody watching this 
where they witness something that's happened to them specifically or something they've witnessed happen to somebody else. So it is very realistic. So the characters we uh, are introduced to is Marcus, who is uh, Marcus and Melody are brother and sister. So Marcus is um, a music student. He's really into music. Uh, he's very, um, he's kind of a shut in. Uh, he also likes to write a lot. So he's, he's kind of an introvert. He's uh, very, very private in his life. And um, he's, he's kind of a paranoid kid uh, for reasons which are explained later. But um, his parents, along, as, along with Melody's parents, because they're related, are divorced and oftentimes they're not around. So Marcus and Melody are left to fend for themselves a lot. Uh, Melody is also a very shy girl. And uh, you can tell that she's hiding a lot um, in her. And she's she's got a lot of walls put up and she builds a lot of stress and a lot of emotions inside of her, kind of like a pop bottle being shaken that she just never is able to let out kind of thing. We got this uh, character named Luke. He is the stereotypical jock of the school six-pack, plays for the soccer team or football team, whatever. It's very into sports, um, jet black hair, all the girls want him, all the girls. He's, uh, has a girlfriend, steady girlfriend named Sarah, who we're also introduced to Sarah. But Luke is like the popular boy jock kind of thing, the tall guy. Um, and Sarah is bulimic or anorexic. I'm not sure exactly which one, but she basically throws up her food every time she eats, and she's very, very body conscious. Uh, she's jealous of every other girl in the school, one of them being Melody, um, and she's the girl who's dating uh, Luke. And then we have Steven. Steven is a nerdy kid. He's the nerd of the school, always being picked on. Uh, this kid was born with uh, two urethras, so he has a bladder problem and he wets himself uncontrollably with absolutely no control whatsoever all the time. So he suffers this great embarrassment all the time and is like constantly picked on because of this and he really really struggles you can tell he's um a passionate kid with a lot of things especially um like there's a scene where he uh not too not spoiling anything but there's a scene where he like has this point in one of the interviews where he starts pretending to be a, a soccer announcer and like a like a a voiceover, a, basically an announcer for sports, and uh, you can tell he's very driven into it. So he's a very driven kid to what he enjoys, but he is so, his self-esteem is shot because of this situation that he's in with his bladder problem. And then lastly, we've got uh, Sean. Uh, Sean is like the punk rebel um, introvert again, stoner kid who is very... Um, very, how should I say, uh, short-circuited and very self, like, defensive. He's always on defense mode. Um, and this is because he is not straight. So he's, uh, he's gay and he obviously struggles with this insecurity because he feels that the world is against him because of this. Even though he's completely out and has no problem with himself being gay, he's very proud of himself, which he should be but he just feels that nobody can accept him because of his life choice. And he's this, um, you couldn't even really tell that he is. He's not very flamboyant, but he, he is very openly into what he's into. And he basically is always on attack mode because he feels everybody's against him pretty much. So you got those six characters and those six kids leave the film and we go one at a time kind of back and forth through their lives. This film is shot also in um, blended scenes. So you'll have a situation happen and then somebody will leave and then it'll focus on another character and they will uh, be like, we'll be following them and then they'll kind of cr cross paths. So you see what happened before in a situation and what was happening at the same time, excuse me, I'm burping, what was happening at the same time with another character while they cross paths and what happened before, what happened after, yada, yada. So they do that a lot. Uh, the director has a sharp eye and a sharp, sharp wit when it comes to directing, writing especially. The, the film is written extremely well. And um, an eye for the camera. There's a lot of steady shots. There's a lot of shots that follow. There's a lot of shots that go around characters, through hallways. It really 
it shapes out this high school very, very, very well. Um, and then you have your interview scenes along the way where there's even the title card at, at the beginning of each character's uh, speeches um, that shows their name at the beginning of the film. And it's very easy to, you know, um, learn about every character in this film. It doesn't, uh, you don't forget about characters, you don't lose track of who's doing what or who's going through what kind of thing. It's very, very straightforward when it comes to character development, in my opinion. So, um, by the end of the film, obviously it reveals the tragedy, but you're kind of figuring out what the tragedy is and who is involved in this tragedy throughout the film, and it's basically up to you to guess. I, like I said, I think I mentioned already that the reason why I want to watch this film today, in my perspective now, is to see if it's obvious who like who is involved in this tragedy because I don't know if I watched it today I would be able to pick it up like that um, and I still watch the film in a sense where like is it easy to pick up because like I said when I watched it first I didn't pick it up at all but somebody watching this today for the first time could pick it up very quickly I know people who are very intellectual uh, I've watched films with people who are very intellectual where I never would have guessed something and they guess in like 15 20 minutes so um, I just wonder how I would do with a film like this today, but uh, that's a spoiler-free review on 237. Um, I recommend anybody watching it, and anybody watching from here on forward, I'm talking full spoilers, so definitely go watch this film. I recommend before you come back and watch the rest of this video, or if you don't give a fuck, stay tuned, and from here on out, it's going to be spoilers. So this is one hell of a remarkable feat from a 22-year-old kid, in my opinion. I did see the behind-the-scenes footage, and this kid definitely um, knew what he was doing for a first-time project. This is the kind of film that any film student thrives to make, um, is a film like this. And especially with all the, the festival circuits that it hit, it's one amazing accomplishment for him, and good for him 100%. Uh, Morali K. Thaluri, if I'm pronouncing that correct. Very good job. Uh, this film is bleak, man. Um, this, it hits so hard because it's so true in its themes of uh, the, the people who are the quietest are the ones to hurt themselves most often. It's the people who don't say anything. It's the people who who are ignored by everybody. And there's even a quote by Luke that I, that I, it's, I, I'd say I love it, but I don't because it's, it, it pisses me off to, to be quite frank is when at the end of the film, he's like, sometimes you just get so wrapped up in your own problems that you kind of just forget everything else and everyone else around you. And yeah, throughout this film, everybody is so self-centered and none, like, none of the characters are really likable necessarily but you're you're only seeing the side of them that's negative and shitty um every single fucking person on the planet in high school in adulthood in childhood are dealing with shit like every single person is dealing with shit and the more people pass judgment on anybody the harder it is for anybody to come forward and will want to come forward the harder you make it for that person and kelly at the end of the film who ends up being the person in the film you see the least <laughs> um being the victim and the one to kill herself and i actually timed the 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 scene in her suicide it's four minutes and 50 seconds of straight uh pain and torments that she's giving herself and acting and her crying and um it's insane um and it's in it's in my opinion a really uh clever and well done job on the director's part uh morali in making her kind of that ghostly figure in the background not in a creepy way obviously but that girl who's just there and nothing no attention to detail is played on this girl on purpose because she is the girl that everybody just doesn't have time for and for no good reason this girl is beautiful uh this girl 
in a very humble way, wants to help everybody. She's not in anybody's face. You know, there's the scene where she comes into the music room where um, Marcus is playing piano and she asks him about his story and she's very intrigued in him. And she's very intrigued in Greg too, one of Greg's only friends. One of the only people in that whole school that treats Greg like a human being and a good person. And she's she just comes up to him and she's like, are you all right? You're bleeding. And not trying to interrogate anybody, not trying to bother anybody, but even still, she just doesn't get any attention from, or any time of day from anybody. And it's absolutely ridiculous how anybody can ha not have time to even just acknowledge, you know, another person. There's this thing I do in my own social media when I see people boast about being there for anybody and coffee's always available and uh, what is this? Bell Let's Talk. A lot of, you know, Bell Let's Talk is a very popular thing where, you know, people can call in and talk about whatever issues they're going through, which is awesome. Fantastic. Great company. But there's so many people that I see on social media boasting, like, you can call me whenever time, whenever you need. I'll be here for anybody, anytime. Ring me up, message me, drop me a, a message and I'll, you know, anytime you need me. Uh, life is better than death. If you, th if you think it's the end, don't worry, I'm always here. I keep an eye for these things, okay? And the first thing I do when I see anybody post something like that is I will message them and just say, hey, how's it going? You know what I get 99% of the time? Crickets. Yeah, not kidding. Try it sometime. Next time you see somebody post that they'll always be there for anybody, try sending them a message. Won't even get read, probably. And uh, I have no tolerance for that at all, because uh, if you're going if you're going to put yourself out there saying that you will be there for anybody, you better damn well fucking be there for anybody, because you can cost somebody their life. So um, that's just a little tidbit about myself, <laughs> but it's it's true and it's serious and it it really is serious because you know, and as for the people going through anything like Kelly in this film. Um, there, there is too many options right now. We are living in 2022. Um, it doesn't matter what you're going through. There is somebody that you can call. You got, you know, most people are on social media. We got Facebook, we got Instagram, we've got TikTok, even, I don't even know if it, like, you can like personally message there or anything, but even just let's deal with the two big Instagram and, uh, Facebook ones. What does the average person have? 200 to 400 friends, okay? There's 200 to 400 people you could message if you're in a crisis. And then there's family, okay? Lots of people have that, even distance family. And then there's medical facilities, hospitals, clinics, suicide hotlines. There's hundreds of them. There's churches. There's religious um, sanctuaries, buildings temples, mosques, neighbors, okay? There's too many fucking people to go through to potentially help you before killing yourself. Don't do that shit. Just, it's not remotely worth it. Life gets better. This is, <laughs> I'm reviewing a film, but I, these things are really important subject matters that has that relates to this and with which basically this film is completely about and uh, i know high school is a hell of a rough time like i know this for a fact i've been there i wasn't popular in high school i wasn't confident in high school especially between the grades of the grades 9 to 11 so 9 10 and 11 were my worst years 12 i boosted um you know my give a shit <laughs> level and I got rid of that completely and I just I basically said fuck it to judgments and fuck it to what anybody thinks about me and I just kind of became this you could say egotistical person but just I, I literally could give a fuck what people thought of me after grade 12. Um, I started to become like the type of person where if I did something that somebody would make fun of me for I would just do that thing stronger, you know, if somebody, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter what it was.
you know, if somebody made fun of me for like starting my shoulders and they were like, why are you starting your shoulders? I'd just start going even more <laughs> and just, just start like being myself, just doing whatever, you know, obviously like I'm not hurting anybody. So fuck it. And that's the advice I'd give anyone else really. But like nine through 11, I always had the problem. See, Kelly always had the problem that she felt invisible. Me, because of my insecurities and my hangups, I always thought that people were staring at me and judging me at all times. Um, you know, walking down the hall, I would always be kind of sweaty and like nervous because every person I passed, I would always think that they were judging me on something, whether it's, you know, the hat I'm wearing, the clothes I'm wearing, how I'm walking. I would slump a lot too, which is funny how I mentioned about the broadening my shoulders because I was kind of, I would slump so much that I would kind of look like a humpback because I was so insecure and so shy. And I didn't even have like a style. I just kind of grew my hair out, uh, never styled it. I had kind of like this frizzy, curly, not afro, but like long, shaggy thing that was never styled or done. I had glasses, very thick rimmed glasses, started wearing contacts in grade 12. But, uh, and I just never knew how to put myself together. But, um, so I was always that kid who was afraid of, <laughs> afraid of judgment, afraid of being bullied kind of thing, or afraid of being um, judged just walking down the hallway. Sometimes I would just like go hide in music class all lunch. So, you know, I was around people who I knew that wouldn't judge me. I, I did that a lot. But uh, so it seems like I had kind of the opposite problem that Kelly has in this film. But um, thankfully, and I feel kind of blessed like this, that I've never in my life had um, suicidal thoughts. And I know exactly what I would do if I had suicidal thoughts. I'd immediately get help. That's, I know exactly what I would do. I certainly wouldn't, you know, make a permanent decision. It's just not worth it. And if, if my words are helping anybody, there's too many options. There's way too many options for life not to be worth it. There just is, so... I hope I can help at least one person listening to me right now. It's not worth it. That decision is not worth it. Um, Melody and Marcus, the brother and sister, all also disturb me too. The fact that this film goes as far as dealing with incest, um, and just like the suicide scene, that rape scene involving Marcus and Melody is uh, horrendous. And... I mean, it's just, it's just rough. Um, when he comes into a room and he, I don't know if he just takes it out of his mind that she's awake and crying because he comes in, he kind of like quietly gets into her bed and starts touching her and everything. And you can tell as the audience that she's awake because she's crying. But, you know, obviously there's no way that he can do what he does without waking her. But I don't know if he's just so mentally distraught and sick in the head that he just just um, ignores it and just does what he has to do. But um, I like how they subtly tell his backstory, too. Like, he was talking about him and Melody being kids and sleeping in the living room. And then his mom and dad came home and just started fucking in the middle of the living room thinking that they were asleep when he was he at least was pretending to be asleep and he kind of mentions that just subtly like you know I should have been disgusted but during his interview and you can tell that that it was certainly most definitely that that messed him up as a kid sexually um witnessing your parents have sex in the living room while you're pretending to sleep I mean that would mess up any kid but uh oh I heard um this quote once, uh, I think it was sin, suffer, repeat. I think it was a, a quote in a movie, like, um, on a movie poster. I forget which one now, but, uh, maybe it'll come to me. Uh, sin, suffer, repeat. It, you know, it makes sense. Uh, one person sins, they suffer, and then someone repeats the sin. You know, the wit, the witness, the, the person hurt by the sinner repeats, right? Um, it's kind of that situation with Marcus and that one moment in time when he was a child fucked his future 
and fucked Melody's future because she ends up pregnant. It's it's so sick. It's I'm telling you this whole film is is gut wrenching. I mean, Sarah, as bad as her situation is compared to everything else, her being bulimic and her having this delusional fantasy about the relationship she has with Luke, who also is gay, and uh, he doesn't, he's the jock, how can the jock and the football star who, you know, every chick is throwing her pussy at him, how can he be gay, right? Uh, Or bi, whatever, but they claim that he's gay, and uh, Sean has that massive love for him, like actual legitimate love. And you can tell when he breaks down in that janitor's closet or whatnot after he had that fight with Luke in the bathroom. And I really love that subtle shower scene with Luke too. That's one of my favorites when he's taking a shower with the boys after the, after the game and uh, he's facing the wall while he's showering himself and pretending to be like in a bad mood or whatnot. But I mean, you can clearly tell why as soon as he turns around and he's seeing naked bodies, he's going to get hard. And then where does he go from there, right? He's going to get ridiculed. It's like, why are, you getting a, why are you getting a hard eye in front of all the dudes, man? What's wrong with you? Um, I mean, kudos to, again, the director who was able to write something like this so realistically and so passionately and uh, Murali K. Thillery. And so raw. Like, this is raw cinema. This is raw, low-budget uh, independent cinema. This is the definition of an indie film right here. Uh, there's actually an actress that went on to some big things, uh, Teresa Palmer, who plays Melody, Marcus's sister. She was in the film Kill Me Three Times, which is also Australian and stars um, the guy I'm blanking his name from Shaun of the Dead <laughs> and uh, Hot Fuzz and uh, The World's End. Um, I'm blanking on his name. Well, maybe I'll put it down here. Um, and she was in uh, a couple other things. One more recent American film, I'm quite sure. I went through her uh, filmography, but I'm I'm forgetting everything she was in. But she she made it to a lot of films, and she made it like international uh, when it comes to acting. So she she took off for sure. Um, yeah, I. It's a powerful film to say the least. Um, I didn't even take too many notes because I, this film is kind of engraved in my brain already. Um, this film could very well be a book. This could be written as a book easily. Uh, it's not, but if a book came out before this film was made, I would not be surprised. Um, there's a few quotes I like throughout the film, like the Sean who's gay is like, you know, I hate this homosexual stuff. You, you know, I'm gay. It's what it is. You don't call a pussy a vagina. Uh, well, I mean, you kind of do. Unless he's referring to a pussy meaning a person, like a person who's like a little bitch. Uh, unless he's referring to that, like you don't call a pussy a vagina, meaning a, like a pussy-ass person, then it would, might make sense. But you could still call that person a vagina. <laughs> I just found that that quote funny. Um, yeah, Kelly's death is is just horrendously sad. The The blood pouring out of her arm. It was a really good effect. I'm like, I'm wondering if it was like CGI or if they used a prosthetic arm. But if they used a prosthetic arm, it moves exactly like a, a real arm does. Really, really uh, realistic looking stuff. For good or for uh, bad. I don't know. For better or for worse, I mean. Um, there's the whole argument in class and debate when they're talking about um, can same-sex parents raise a child properly and... Uh, you know, this triggers Steve, obviously. Not Steve, uh, Sean. My apologies. And uh, everybody in the class is acting like assholes and having their own opinions. And they're like, you know, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And Sean, being a massive atheist, is like, you know, that's all a myth, right? And, you know, clearly, same-sex parents can lovingly raise a child just like... Or sorry. Yeah, same-sex parents can lovingly raise a child just like... A uh, man and a woman can, which I don't see why not. You know, you, you, two good people <laughs> can lovingly raise any child, no matter what they are. So, um, but yeah, other than not like overstaying its welcome and being really well shot, there's just those two scenes that are just so 
so hard to watch. It's that suicide scene and then it's that incestual scene that is disgusting. And and Melody ending Melody ending up pregnant because of it and being completely innocent. All these kids you would predict to be suicidal for what they're going through, all of them. And somehow they live and they just bottle it all up inside and ignore the rest of the world. And then Kelly, who is the cutest girl ever, even in her interview scene at the end of the film where she's talking about that little kid with the tiger paint on his face and just her facial expressions and she's just so filled with joy and beauty and uh, cuteness and she's the girl next door you want to take home to mama and she just wastes it all away. This film is also dedicated to a girl named Kelly, the, a really good friend of the director, so this is a personal story from the director. This is a passion project that he put together for his friend who... I'm assuming committed suicide and uh, it's just a fucking waste it's a it's a fucking waste man <sighs> I mean Megan was the prettiest girl in my opinion she's the girl that I'd be after maybe not in high school because it was a shy little fuck but you know I she's the type of girl that I would that I am into that's the kind of personality she has she's just humble and giggly and bubbly and uh you know always smiling and always positive but witnessing everything around her as a nightmare and horror show because she knows everything that's going on with every character she knows greg's torment she knows marcus and melody's fuckiness she knows sarah's a delusion delusional ways uh maybe she knows that luke is secretly gay too like she, she doesn't really interact too much with luke specifically but or sean but um like and nobody gives her the time of day like i said marcus in the music room um i forgot to mention too the story marcus um writes apparently you never get to read the story but there's a scene where the teacher is talking to him um kind of concerned because of the content of the story, I think he wrote a story, excuse me, I think he wrote a story along the lines of shooting up the school or a character who's in love with this girl and um, there's, a sh there's a school shooting of some kind or there's this violent act of some kind in his story and he keeps insisting that it's just a story. It's something he put together through his imagination. Although there's, it's inspired by people he knows and things he knows, it doesn't, he's very... Um, He's very hurt that people are reading the story and thinking that he's basically announcing what he wants to do. And I can relate to that because there's a lot of things. I remember in high school once, I wore this um, My Chemical Romance shirt. I was in high school between 2003 and 2007. And uh, I was really into My Chemical Romance, uh, a lot of emo stuff, punk rock. Punk music especially, especially dark punk. Um, and I wore this My Chem shirt. Um, with a gun on it and it said fire at will um, which is a lyric of one of their songs uh, if this is what he wants then fire at will or something like that um, and it had like a revolver on it and with a with a red heart like kind of like a broken red heart kind of thing and one of my teachers literally came up to me he's like what what does that shirt mean and I'm like oh it's a shirt uh, one of my favorite bands oh um, okay uh, what does the gun mean like, it's, it's just a gun through a heart. I don't know. I thought the shirt looked good. And she's, she's like, are you trying to, like, represent something? And she was so concerned. I didn't even, like, necessarily clue in on what she was talking about. I just, I'm like, I, I thought, like, maybe, like, because the shirt had a gun on it and I went to a Catholic school that I was doing something wrong. But, no, I think she was literally worried that I had, you know violent thoughts or something like that which i've never had i mean I've, yeah i've been angry at people before but i've been angry at bullies before but jesus christ um but you know you understand the concern with stuff like that and you can as an adult especially get behind the worries that adult has especially teachers and especially people in faculties and schools i mean it's a terrifying um idea and if things like that never happened then it'd be one thing but they do so um, but yeah, his story, he's so proud of this story. And then, you know, one of the teachers reads it and instead of like, he praises it, but he's, he's very concerned about the subject matter and, um, and, and knowing Marcus, 
as the story progresses, him raping his sister and shit. Uh, you know, you never know what's going on inside a kid's mind like that. Do I think he'd shoot up the school? I don't think so. Um, from watching the movie, I don't think he would be a risk in my opinion, but that's, you know, who knows. But point is, like, a lot of times there is situations where you can put you can put a story down on paper or on a movie or uh, a song, you know, fuck Eminem, man. The guy, were, the guy, like, I was a kid and I was listening to Eminem and I'm like, has Eminem ever, like, murdered a lot of people? Like, fuck. And, uh, and even he'll joke about it in other songs. He'll be like, you know, when people listen to my music and I say I'm going to kill somebody that they think I'm actually going to do it and stuff like that. So he, he always, like, played with that, like, with the critics' responses and parents responses and stuff like that marilyn manson another example people think that you know gun gun violence is raised because of him he's okay because of what he puts on freaky makeup so therefore i mean the guys the watch him in interviews <laughs> i swear to god he has outclassed so many people so many professional suit and tie wearing fucking news casters and and interviewees he has outsmarted so so many it's not even funny very smart guy. i've never been into his music i've never been a huge marilyn manson fan but uh i can appreciate his style and i can appreciate his intelligence the man is intelligent as fuck but um there you go less than half of this review is about 237 not really but it's the whole everything i'm talking about relates to the film and um these are the kind of films that i love the most is films that can really get me going and and talk about real life situations and i'm sure that's exactly what the director morelli kathaluri was going for um you know making this a passion project to one of his best friends who unfortunately you know checked out too early and it's a damn shame but you know what she would be proud of this and uh you know it's work like this that really gets people moving and that every young person should watch every high schooler should watch this in my opinion um and you know the subject matter is heavy and it's not a comfortable film to watch in a lot of scenes but you know and it's just like kelly's character witnessing this stuff and knowing that shit like this happens just gives you a disgust in your in the pit of your stomach and there's a lot of people who can't watch, can't handle films like this my mom's one of them um she can't watch anything fuck she she won't even there's some pg-13 film she can't watch but it's it's stuff like this that you know that a lot of it is true and and hits too close to home not i shouldn't say that too close to reality is what i meant to say and uh yeah i don't know it's uh, it's a film to be discussed. This is a film class discussion. Even like outside of the subject matter, the way the film is made um, and shot and directed and uh, and produced, it's it's a feat and a half. The editing is nice and um, it's uh, it's one to check out. That's Kelly, by the way. For anybody, well, anybody who was watching this, I hope has seen this film already. <laughs> anybody watching up to now, but uh, what a beautiful girl. 237, 2006 film. Morali K. Thaluri is the director. Um, if you're watching up to now and you haven't seen this film and you think you can stomach it, go watch it. But uh, to everybody else, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It premiered at the Cannes Festival as, uh, as well. Cannes Festival in France, so that's another festival circuit that it hit. Um, that's all I got on it. I've said absolutely everything I needed to say about this film, except for one thing. Luke also mentions that in high school you gotta be tough. I'm um, sure nobody gets bullied and goes home and cries about it. He's dead wrong. And he's like, if you can't survive high school, how are you gonna survive the real world? It's like, well, you know what? You can actually make the choice not to be a dick. You can just make the choice not to be a dick. It's like, he's like, oh, well, you know, you gotta toughen up and every time you get bullied, you just, you, you, you fake it and stuff like that. How about just not be a dick? How about just people stop being a dick to each other in high school? There's absolutely no freaking point. Like I said, everybody is dealing with shit. Everybody. Be kind. Like Gary Vaynerchuk says, be kind. Be humble, okay? Kindness is not weakness. Kindness is strength. That's my last message that I'm giving out in this review to any of my subscribers and 
uh, audience members watching. Kindness is strength, not weakness. All right? To all the young kids, to all the adults, kindness is strength, not weakness. Subscribe to Morgan Film Fan if you like to listen to my voice or if you like my film reviews. I'll be back with more, so stay tuned if you're interested. Until next review, take care, have a great night, and cheers.